In our chapter on radioactivity or nuclear chemistry, we examine that very topic of radioactivity, nuclear chemistry, both of which involve changes within the nuclei. You know, in our journey of chemistry, we have really focused on electrons as being most important part of, a, of an atom, and in specifically the uh, valence electrons that are um, part of an ordinary chemical change. But unlike that very process, which elements retain their identity, nuclear process often result in one element changing into another, frequently emitting tremendous amounts of energy along the way. So if we're changing the identity of an atom, we have to manipulate the nucleus. The number of protons within the nucleus give the atom its identity. So radioactivity has numerous applications, including the diagnosis and treatment of medical conditions, you know, such as cancer and thyroid disease, abnormal kidney and bladder function, heart disease. Naturally occurring radioactivity also allows us to estimate the age of fossils, such as rocks and ancient artifacts. Perhaps you've heard of something like carbon-14 dating from an archaeological dig. Gives us an idea of how old a fossil is. And radioactivity, perhaps most famously, led to the discovery of nuclear fission, which can be used for electricity generation and, of course, nuclear weapons. So in our chapter, we learn about radioactivity, how it was discovered, what it is, and how we use it. We had mentioned the application of radioactivity is diagnosis of uh, certain medical conditions. Um, perhaps most famously uh, treating disease. So an x-ray for example would be some kind of um, application of radioactivity. I'm going to try to change the slide to the slide number two and it's got a pause there so we'll let that catch up. Radioactivity is the emission of subatomic particles or high energy electromagnetic radiation by the nuclei of certain atoms. So in nuclear medicine, changes in the structure of the nucleus are used in many ways. Nuclear radiation may be used to visualize or test structures in your body to see if they are operating properly. I know that uh, some people who have undergone um, medical tests might swallow something along the lines of uh, radioactive iodine. Some people have to take uh, barium and, and undergo a, an x-ray to see inside the body. So it's a labeled atom and they can intake or output can be monitored. How long it takes to process through the body can then be monitored with this labeled atom and uh, some kind of radioactive uh, element that they can pick up on an x-ray. So to treat diseases, it might be caused in radiation as ionizing and allows us not only to see healthy tissue, but unhealthy tissue as well. So radioactivity radioactivity is the emission of subatomic particles or high energy electromagnetic such atoms are said to be radioactive, and most radioactive emissions can pass through many types of matter, such as skin or muscle, in this case, in terms of a medical condition. And really, to perform tests, antibodies, like naturally occurring molecules that fight infection, were labeled with radioactive atoms and then injected into the bloodstream. And since antibodies attack infection, they migrate to the areas where the body, uh, where infection is present, and where the, the um, medical staff then can see with an invisible eye, if you will, uh, through an x-ray. Um, really where the radioactive labeled antibodies landed and they're able to detect if, if uh, we have healthy tissue or unhealthy tissue by where those radioactive labels land. Oh, radioactivity is that first word there. So when we begin thinking about the discovery of radioactivity, it really was back in the um, about the turn of the, the uh, century in about 1900. And the first person really to discover radioactivity was a French scientist named Antoine Henri Bacquerel. So you can hear that French name in that term Bacquerel.
He was interested in the newly discovered x-rays and were a hot topic of physics at this time. And I think about uh, chemistry and physics really having an overlap in the nuclear uh, field. Uh, physicists have always been interested in the nucleus. Ordinary chemical change uh, always respond to the valence electrons. So here we have an overlap when we're thinking about nuclear chemistry. Bacquerel hypothesized that x-rays were emitted in conjunction with something called phosphorescence. Phosphorescence, if you see this um, slide, what we're looking at is a glow-in-the-dark soccer ball. And that, of course, wasn't in his time, but it's giving us an example of something that has phosphorescence when that soccer ball has been out in the sunlight and has absorbed radiation. We can literally turn the lights off, and that phosphorescence is still emitting radiation. There's light coming out of the atoms, and it's it, it, light that they had absorbed, the energy that they absorbed is still being emitted, and it gives that unusual green glow. So that emission of light that sometimes follows the absorption of light by certain atoms and molecules contains phosphorescence. It's probably most familiar to us just really in the glow of glow-in-the-dark products, such as toys, and I've even seen stickers that have glow-in-the-dark. After such a product is exposed to light, it readmits some of the light, usually at kind of a slightly longer wavelength, and that's that eerie green glow that we see when we turn the room lights off. So that greenish glow of the light is coming out as a form of radiation. And Bacquerel hypothesized that this visible greenish glow was somehow associated with the emission of x-rays, which are invisible. So to test his hypothesis, he placed crystals. And these crystals were composed of a compound that contained uranium. That compound had a name. It was called potassium urinal sulfate. Here that urinal, U-R-A-N-Y-L, comes from that element called uranium. Alrighty. So he, he used this compound that was emitting radiation, which was known to phosphoresce, uh, just like this soccer ball. And he put this um, crystal on top of a photographic plate, wrapped it in a black cloth, and then exposed those crystals to sunlight. And he knew the crystals had phosphoresced because he could see the emitted light when he brought them back into the dark. And if the crystals were also emitting x-rays, those x-rays would have to pass through the black cloth, go right through that material, and expose the underlying photographic plate, just as an x-ray exposed plate becomes developed. And Bacquerel performed the experiment several times and he was always, always getting the same result. The photographic plate showed a dark exposed spot where the crystals had been and you can see that on the slide. Underneath the soccer ball is Bacquerel's exposed plate. So he believed his hypothesis was correct and presented his results. The phosphorescence and x-rays were linked and he presented that to the French Academy of Sciences. So with the discovery of radioactivity, we're looking at a photographic plate, and this really is Bacquerel's original uh, comments uh, labeled at the top of that plate. And he played really a key role in discovery of radioactivity. Time frame again, about 1900. His lifespan, uh, 1852 to 1908. And Bacquerel placed a uranium-containing compound on the plate, which was wrapped in the black cloth to shield it from visible light. He found the plate was darkened by some unknown form of penetrating radiation that was produced continuously and independently of the phosphorescence. So Bacquerel later retracted his results, however, when he discovered that a photographic plate with the same crystal showed a dark exposure even when the plate and crystals were stored in a drawer and never had been exposed to sunlight. So somehow he was starting to make the link that the crystals themselves were constantly emitting something that exposed the photographic plate regardless of whether or not they phosphoresced. So in other words, if they were glowing in the dark, and there are natural compounds that do that, not just a green soccer ball, glow-in-the-dark crystals he believed were emitting x-rays, but now all of a sudden, having never been exposed to x-rays, these urinal crystals, these uranium-containing crystals, were still exposing um, 
these plates. And so now we're starting to make the connection that the uranium itself within the crystals was the source of the emissions and not anything to do with the sunlight. He named these um, you, like radiation emitting type rays, he actually called them uranic rays from the element uranium. So thinking about the very beginning of the discovery, what it was is, is having something in your hand that, uh, you know, a crystal containing uranium. Remember that we had no idea that this was bad for us holding radiation in our hands at this time. And Baccarel soon became um, known for calling them uranic rays. So discovering certain minerals that were constantly producing energy rays that could penetrate matter go right through any kind of soft tissue, go right through a black cloth and develop on a plate. These rays were produced even though the mineral was not exposed to outside energy. I did, you know, he performed his first experiments using sunlight over and over as the source and then realized when he put his experiment away in a drawer that obviously was not getting any sunlight that the same thing started to happen. So putting this together, he, he realized that energy apparently is being produced without any energy input. So something is going on. About this time, Soon after this discovery, we have a young lady, a graduate student named Marie Curie, one of the first women in France to pursue doctoral work in the field of chemistry. She's quite the pioneer. And she also decided to study uranic rays for her doctoral thesis. Her first task was to determine whether any other substances besides uranium, the heaviest known element of the time, emitted these rays. And in her search, Curie discovered two new elements, both of which also emitted uranic rays. Curie named one of these newly discovered elements polonium. Polonium is named after her home country of Poland. And the other element she named radium because of its high level of radioactivity. Radium is so radioactive that it gently glows in the dark and emits significant amounts of heat. Since it was clear that these rays were not unique to uranium, Curie had to change the name of these original uranic rays. She decided to call it radioactivity. Since uranium is not the only element that's radioactive, we altered the name. 1903, Curie and her husband, Pierre Curie, as well as Baccarel were all awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of radioactivity. And in 1911, Curie received a second Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the discovery of two new elements, radium and polonium. So the Curies, she's shown here with her um, children and her famous husband as well, Pierre Curie, all worked in the field of radioactivity. Let's pause here and take a look at the types of radioactivity in our next lesson. So stop the video here.